Galatians 4, starting in verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set forth by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world, whose slaves you want to become once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It's always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I'm again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai of Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she's in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she's our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the time he was born, according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now. What does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit the son of the free woman. So brothers, we're not children of the slave, but of the free woman. There is a lot there. A lot there. What we're going to do is take six principles from that that we can directly apply to our lives, to give us the overview of what that is all about, in context with what we've already learned. First, I just want to, in our culture, right, we see a lot in this about free and slave and uh, sons and heirs and all these words that have a lot of meaning, um, culturally a lot of significance, biblically. But all in all, this is a chapter talking about what our freedoms in Christ look like, what it means that we're free in Christ. So in our culture, we have an abundance of freedoms. And I think largely we would agree that freedom is a good thing. Um, the freedoms that Christ have afforded us is a good thing. We see in our culture some great freedoms. One example of a great freedom is uh, this gathering. We're able to gather here 
together, sing to Jesus, preach God's word, and have little to no threat of disruption. That's not the case for many of our brothers and sisters around the world who cannot just show up comfortably on Sunday morning with no threat to their lives. It's not always the case. We should not take that freedom for granted. That's a good freedom. Another good free freedom is our ability to, for example, choose to have a family. We can choose to be married, choose not to be married. We can choose to have children. We can choose not to have children. And to those of us who want children, that's like, well, that stinks. But to those of us who may not want children, that might be a good thing. Some people are called to singleness. Generally speaking, we have economic freedom, right? For the most part. We have freedom to purchase what we want. You can, as long as your credit good, you can go buy the car, or you got a lot of cash flow. <laughs> you, you can go buy the car that you want today. You could go up to uh, one of these dealers. I don't know. <laughs> There's plenty of dealerships. You go up to one of them, say, here's my old, in with the new. You have the freedom to purchase whatever car you want. You can pick what clothes to wear. You can pick what brands of food you want to eat, travel where you want. The list is endless. We have freedom upon freedom upon freedom, but there's also bad freedoms in our culture. We have the, according to our culture, we have freedom to terminate pregnancy and life whenever we want to, for the most part. We have freedom to hate people. You do. As long as you don't act on that, you can hate whoever you want. And the freedom to choose what gender we are. Freedom to marry whomever we want. As far as our culture goes, these are all great freedoms, as far as our culture goes. But what culture doesn't realize or dictate or perceive is that ultimately these freedoms enslave us. They enslave us ultimately to sin, but this comes out in this sin of spiritual independence. I got this. I don't need God to dictate my life. We don't need God to thrive in our culture. We got money upon money and abundance upon abundance. I don't realize it's not everyone, but there's opportunity. They ultimately enslave us to death. The penalty of sin is death. They enslave us to the opinions and norms of others, right? The things acceptable today weren't acceptable decades ago. And not only that, they can change in an instant, and it allows no independent thought. You're either with the wave of society or you're outcasted. We're forced to conform to what people would like us to conform to. Ultimately, the way to true freedom is through Christ Jesus, and more specifically, submission to him, and submission to his way of doing things. So as we look at these six carryouts that we have for this chapter, I want us to think about, and I believe will help us understand, uh, that one, our freedom uh, is in Christ alone— Two, it will remind us of the dangers around us. And three, encourage us to remain faithful to Christ in the midst of the world we live in. So our first carry out is that no one is truly free without Christ. No one is truly free without Christ. You know, Paul uses a lot of language in this chapter that gives us a lot of imagery. He uses language of slavery and freedom and sons and heirs. And he begins chapter 3 by saying in verse 3 that we were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. Enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. And to get this point across, he des describes the similarity of a slave to a son that has not come of age. Now, I first want to say that we need to interpret slavery differently than our context would typically allow us to interpret slavery, okay? Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but 
what we think of as Americans in our historical context of slavery is not what he was experiencing then. It's different. Uh, this is also not a, a thumbs up for slavery either. It's not a saying that this is a good thing in any context but it is a different context. For example, there could have been academics and well-established business people who were known in the community that could easily become slaves. How? Well, there was no, for example, financial backing by banks if the economy went up, right? So you could have a person who was very successful, very well-educated, very uh, much a leader in the community that, went, that business maybe goes belly up and they have no choice but to sell themselves and their family into servitude to another family that may may be of lesser status than them, but has money. So a farmer, for example, could own a very influential family in the community. Now, generally speaking, this wasn't always the case, to be fair, but generally speaking, there was a period of time when that person would purchase back their freedom. In other words, they would get off their, uh, on their feet, not off their feet, they would get on their feet and be able to purchase back their freedom. Again, this is not a, 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 a cosign for slavery, it's just to say that it was different. So when he's saying a son and a slave is not really different, we would say, what? but it's a different context. The point is the child, just like the slave, had no real rights and authority over the household, even though the son is the heir of all things in the house. Does that make sense? You with me, we doing all right? Okay, so the comparison here has a number of different ways that people interpret this, right? And I could go into all the specifics of like the different theological arguments, but I think instead I wanna pull back and kind of look at a macro level explanation. Okay, so what he means by this is that regardless whether one was a Jew under the law or a Gentile imprisoned under some other religious system of idolatry, we were all, they were all enslaved under some principles of the world, whether they be God's law or be these other religious principles. He's made himself clear that we've already talked about that no works of the law could justify or save anyone. And obviously no other religious system would be able to justify or save someone if they were a Gentile. He even mentions in verse 10 that you observe days and months and seasons and years, and this could totally be a nod to the adherence to astro astrological. Astro is that how you say that word? Astrological observance by both Jews and Gentiles. There were some Jews that believed that uh, the reason Israel got carried away into captivity is because of their focus on astrology and the way they viewed the stars and the seasons and their almost like idolatry of festivities festivals and honoring days and months and years. So whether, you know, Jew or Gentile, same kind of principles apply. They had similar beliefs sometimes in this regard, right? A modern day application may be horoscopes. Like, do I rely so heavily on what this thing is saying? It's like, I put all my stock in this. I know some people would say like, they're wicked, run from them. Like, I don't, I don't know enough about them. I'm not endorsing them. And I'm not telling you you're sinful if you look at them. All I'm saying is it's a modern day application. Observance of these were sort of what he was talking about as elementary principles, and there was no hope and certainly no salvation to be found in them, found in them. Now, even regarding the law, listen to this, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 5 talks about the basic principles of the oracles of God. It's the exact same word. So whether we're talking about basic principles of this world that are kind of governing culture and society that are maybe godless or other as far as religious affiliation, or whether we're talking about the oracles of God's law, the elementary principles of God's law, the point remains the same. None of these things save and none of these things set us free. So no one is truly free without Christ. And that takes us to our second carryout, all can be free in Christ. All can be free in Christ. Now, in contrast to those principles and laws, Paul beautifully explains the gospel in verses 4 and 5. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions, uh, adoption as sons. This is beautiful. 
I want to tell you six things that we can pull out of this directly associated with the gospel, and it is marvelous. The first thing. Paul here demonstrates God's intentionality and planning in salvation. Right? He says, when the fullness of time had come. It means that there was an appointed time when God would send Jesus to redeem his people. Jesus was always the plan. When he came was planned, where he came was planned, how he came was planned. None of the things that we read in this scripture were accidental or by happenstance. It is all intentional. It is all God's plan. He was thorough. God was thorough and intentional in all he accomplished in Christ. Now, the second thing we see here is that he demonstrates Christ was sent. Christ was sent. Why is that important? It says God sent forth his son. He sent Jesus into the world and he sends us into the world. Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, 21, just as the father sent me, so I'm sending you. That so means in the same way, in the same way God sent me, I'm sending you out into this world. And we obviously know the Great Commission. We talk about that a lot. And I'm going to continue to talk about that a lot. But we have a missional God who has missional people who calls us in our job description in the Great Commission to make Jesus' name known to the ends of the earth among all nations, tribes, and tongues. And the third thing is he demonstrates Jesus' humanity. There's many who have said and continue to say that God could not have had a son or Jesus could not be a mere human based on what he did. Our, some of our Muslim friends would say that it's impossible that God would have a son. Not so. Jesus is God's son. Never waver in this truth. In fact, it's Jesus being both fully human and fully divine that he's able to accomplish what he did. We call this theology, from our brother, hypostatic union. <laughs> the reality that Jesus was in himself one person, but two natures. One person, but two natures, human and deity. Colossians 1.19 says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Think about the weight of that statement. In the man Christ Jesus, the human, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It means that Jesus in his divine nature was omniscient, omnipotent, all the things that God is while at the same time in his human nature had need of food. We see Jesus grow in knowledge. We see him physically grow. We see him be tempted. God's not tempted. The scripture's clear about that. But in his humanity, Jesus is tempted. And this is an amazing truth that full, through Christ, God truly understands the human experience which is why the scripture says that he sympathizes with us in our weakness. He's been through literally everything we have been through and worse. He's with us. He's for us. He understands us. The fourth thing, he demonstrates Jesus was born under the law. Jesus lived a perfect life in full and perfect submission and obedience to God. This is something that was necessary for our salvation. Jesus never committed a sin. He obeyed the law perfectly, something no human could have done. Number five, he demonstrates Jesus came to redeem those under the law. The last chapter made it clear that the law, the scripture imprisoned everything under the law, right? Christ came that all who believe in him would be freed from the curse of the law, which is death. 
And number six, he demonstrates our freedom from the law so that. When you see so that's, know that this is the reason the previous thing occurred. So that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters of God. And this leads to our third carry out. Those in Christ are adopted as God's children. An amazing, amazing truth here. Verses 6, and six to 7 and verse 31 talk about Galatian believers being sons. And this should certainly be understood as children of God. It's not that only the males in Galatia were considered children of God. I've said this before, but oftentimes when you see sons or uh, brothers, the word is, uh, is actually... Um, including both male and female, men and women, brothers and sisters. Most of your Bibles will have a footnote. It's usually in the beginning of your, of your Bible, for referencing something in the beginning of your Bible that talks about these words, specific words. One of them is like servant. You know? uh, so uh, know that most of the time, not all the time, to be clear, but most of the time, when you see him referencing a whole church, he's talking about men and women. But think about this truth for a minute. As a result of Christ's redemptive work, God's enemies have not only been purchased, they've not only become like cordial enemies. You know, you ever seen when somebody like kind of gets right with a person they've been at odds with, but like they're definitely not cool. Like they're just like not going to like swing on each other the next time they see one another. It's like we cordial. We know how to be in the same room together and not act a fool, but I don't like them. Like, that is still an enemy, guys, okay? So, like, <laughs> but they're not only cordial enemies, and they're not only, they haven't only become friends. I've become friends with people that I was at odds with in the past. It's deeper than that. God's enemies have now become his children. So based completely on the finished work of Christ, the fact that Jesus came, lived a, the sinless life that we could not live, died the death that we deserved, was buried and raised from the dead in the flesh, we can not only be made right with God, we are God's children, adopted as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. You are accepted, you are chosen, you're wanted, you're desired, you're God's child, and all the privileges thereof. That word Abba, Father, is like a privileged term of endearment that you would say only to your dad. It's like there's a lot of kids we have in the church, and I love them all, and I'm getting to know all of them. Like none of them call me dad. Like, I mean, at text, they could, that would be weird. But like, the, my kids call me dad. Your kids call you dad. That's a privilege to be able to call you dad. Think of Abba in that way. It's a personal, this is my father. Now, he's, he's our father, but he's also my father. I'm privileged to call him father. And he is a great Father, there is no one like him. All right, our fourth carry out. The Holy Spirit is a sign of adoption, is a sign of adoption. Check this out. Verses 6 and 7 say, and because you are sons, right, because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Once we belong to Christ, we are seen as sons and daughters. The Spirit of God comes into our hearts to live. And we have got to see this as one of the greatest truths in all of Scripture. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, here referred to as the Spirit of Christ, is in us who believe. Us. Formerly wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, 
naked enemies of God, now called his children, have been given one of the greatest gifts in the history of the universe. Jesus himself even said in John that it's better that I go and he come to be with you. It's better that Jesus is not like standing on this stage with us, but that God has indwelt each of us. That's better. How? It's always been unbelievable to me. Like, I just want to walk around with Jesus for a little bit. <laughs> kind of intimidated, but, but there's something about the spirit living in us that maybe we're not getting if we don't see it quite like Jesus did. And so here's just four quick things that the spirit does that can help us see rightly this truth. One is the spirit is a sign and guarantee of our inheritance, of our salvation. That's Ephesians 1. He's a sign and guarantee of our inheritance. Number two, he makes known the things of God to us. Wow. The spirit makes known the things of God to us. We see this in John 14, 26, in John 16, 13, and in 1 Corinthians 2, 10. The spirit makes known the things of God to us. Three, he intercedes to God for us and helps in our weakness. Romans 8, 26 to 27. And four, he empowers us as witnesses for Jesus to the ends of the earth. We see that in Acts 1, 8. The Holy Spirit is an absolute essential to our lives. And he is a he, not an it. He is God, the third person of the Trinity, the sort of activator of all things God does. We have to rely on him, especially if we are going to stand. And this brings us to carry out five. All can be tempted back into slavery. All can be tempted back into slavery. This is not as encouraging of a point, but it is incredibly important that we understand this. Paul mentions repeatedly through his letter to the Galatians that they are falling back into slavery or that they are in some way, shape, or form taking a step back by adding things like circumcision to their faith for salvation. Here in this chapter, he's obviously concerned for them. In my Bible, for example, the section that contains this part of the text in verses uh, 8 to 20 is called Paul's concern for the Galatians. He is concerned for their well-being, their spiritual well-being. It was a very personal matter to him. He loved them very much. And in verse 19, he even refers to them as my little children. I have little children. I love them so much. Hear the apostle saying that, my little children, the ones I've spiritually birthed. It's a term of endearment. And he tells him in verse 20, he wishes he could be with them so he could change his tone. He understands he's being a little bit harsh, but this is serious. He needs him to know that this means everything. This isn't a secondary matter. Like, your lives depend on this. He goes as far in verse 19 to say that he's again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in them. Think about that. Ladies who have birthed babies in here, I'm sure you could attest that, like, he is making a case uh, for the worst pain he can think of. Um, and that's how he feels over what's going on with them. He's in distress so strongly that they mature and leave this falsehood behind them and that Christ would be formed in them, that he compares the anguish he feels to giving birth to a child. Now, I'm positive the Apostle Paul never gave birth to a child, but it seems like he may know a thing or two about how painful that process is. That's what he's comparing his anguish over these people. I love you. How is this happening? I'm perplexed. I don't understand. 
I've told you everything you needed to know. I've seen the spirit birthed in you. You didn't need anything else. What is happening? It's killing me. That's why I'm talking to you like this. Turn from that mess. Cast those people out from among you. Get them away. Don't listen to them. This means everything. You can understand why they're being tempted back into this falsehood and these false doctrines and again being enslaved back into enslavement to these elementary principles of the world. He calls them in verse 9, weak and worthless. There's no value in it. This has to be a personal matter to us as well, okay? We cannot turn to legalism or to the patterns and principles of this world having already turned to Christ. We have made a declaration in turning to Jesus that those things are weak and worthless. They add no value to my life. But people still do it all the time. Sometimes we've been guilty of doing it all the time. We add things to our faith, faith works. Got to meet a certain criteria in order to be a Christian. We turn back to the practices and patterns of life that we had before we were in Christ. Falling back into slavery. No matter how free we may feel about it. I mentioned before and I'll continue to mention there's a real tension here in these scriptures, and in, in chapter 5 we'll get to this, but uh, we're free, but we should not be using our freedom in Christ as a covering for sin. And Paul addresses that explicitly in, in chapter 5, and we'll talk about that in two weeks, and, and he tells exactly what the acts of the sinful nature are and exactly what life in the Spirit looks like. And he makes no bones about it, but we'll get there. We can't live the lives we used to live. So what's the answer? We have to live lives that are both free in Christ, relying on him and him alone for our justification and our salvation, while also living in full submission to him, to the standards he has and the authority of his word. For example, some people would tell people they need to add repentance from sin to their faith in order to be saved. Hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying repentance is unnecessary. I'm saying we don't add anything to our faith to be saved. That's untrue. But to tell someone they have no need to repent and turn from their sin lacks an understanding of our call to holiness. Hebrews makes it very clear without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, faith and repentance from sin are sort of like 1A and 1B. There's almost sort of an inseparable part about them. While we're saved by grace through faith, genuine faith is going to produce in us a desire to please God and do what he says. This includes turning from our selfish, sinful, self-centered lives and turning to a selfless Christ-centered life. This is genuine faith. And in fact, the Apostle Paul, the preacher of grace through faith alone, says in Romans 1, he calls it the obedience of faith. So we have to beware not to fall back into old patterns of life and put us back into slavery. And that brings us to our final carry out, carry out six. Remember your freedom. Paul concludes this portion of the letter we're reading today, or the conclusion of this portion we're reading today in chapter 5, verse 1, which I didn't read and I apologize. We'll read it now. It says, uh, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That phrase, stand firm, carries a lot of weight. He says immediately after using Sarah and Hagar as an allegory. Now think about this. If you read Genesis, our reading last week was Genesis. It was the story of Abraham. I think it was Genesis 11 to 25. You would have read the story of Abraham and how Abraham and Sarah take matters into their own hands when they're waiting on God's promise for a son, for an heir. And they make a whole mess. <laughs> like, 
Abraham, under Sarah's direction, has a child with one of their servants, Hagar. And Paul says this is an, he uses this as an allegory to represent the covenant on Mount Sinai, the law. And God also delivers on his promise to Abraham by bringing Isaac. And according to Paul, this in his allegory is the child of promise representing the new covenant. And he says, this is our mother. We're children of the promise. We're children of the faith, of faith, excuse me. In reminding the Gentiles of their position as children of the promise, children of faith, he's reminding them that they have been set free from the old covenant of the law. They've been purchased by Christ. They can now they can be justified and saved not by works of the law or by their former way of life, but justified and saved through Christ alone. He's reminding them of this, and he's reminding them, and he's reminding us through this that this is our identity as well. We have to remind ourselves and one another of these truths. I had somebody recently talk to me about how they essentially weren't living up to certain standards. And I'm not talking about sin things, right? If, if they were like, I just keep going into this thing, I would have said, yeah, you got to stop that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things like their ability to, or their, their consistency in reading. Like, these are all good things. Don't get me wrong. Okay? But their consistency in reading, like all these just different sort of like disciplines, spiritual disciplines that they do and how those things were making them not Christian. It was like, no, 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 no. If we belong to Christ, we're children of the promise. Those things don't make us Christian. Those are things that Christians do. Does that make sense? We are free. In fact, we're free now to give our whole selves to God. Not to be divided and unable to commit to God fully because of sin. That's why Jesus says, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will find it. We're set free now to give all of ourselves to him, and he's worthy of it, and he deserves it, and he asks us for it. It's only in true faith and submission to Christ that we find our real freedom. So that last point was, remember your freedom. Now, in a culture that promises us so many freedoms, and that's so suggestive, it, it, sub, subjective, excuse me, it leaves all the choices up to us, we have to remember that we serve a God who has truly set us free, that it's in him that we find our true freedom. And since he's the one where our freedom is found, uh, he gets to kind of define what freedom looks like. So... Don't take your advice, your pointers from this world and this culture, the way of the world. Find your advice, your instruction in Christ alone. And there's ways to do this that, again, do not save you, but they're best practices for us who believe. It's, there's no shortcut. Listen, y'all don't get tired of hearing me say this. Bible reading and prayer and Christian community. Man, that, like, that's what it is. Like, those things teach us who he is, who we're supposed to be. They hold us accountable. They build intimacy with Christ. They let us know him and be known by him. Paul says that in this chapter, now that you've come to know him or rather be known by him, like, you are known by God. He's not impersonal, far away, and distant, as some would have us believe. He's right here, right now, with you, in you, for you, interceding on your behalf, helping you in your weakness, pleading with the Father for more grace. He's with you. All right, let's look at our next steps. Pull out your phones. Uh, we got our little connect card. You pull that connect card screen up. Yeah, there you go. You could zoom in and hit that QR code. Gonna ask you some questions, uh, name, address, and whether you're first time visitor, member, regular attender. It's gonna, those things are, are the only mandatory parts, but anything else you wanna do, if there's a place you're interested in serving or um, you wanna Tell us what next steps you're going to take. You can go ahead and select those. 
as well. We'd love to hear from you. I love if you have prayer requests, man, one of my favorite highlights of my week, man, is being able to just reach out and tell you I'm praying for you and I love you and I've seen your prayer requests and be able to follow up with so many of you about those things and see God answering, you know, see God answering those things is such an encouragement. All right, so our next step A is schedule time for Bible reading and prayer. Listen, I know most of you, I know that you, most of you already do this, uh, but listen, what I'm saying is schedule it. It don't matter if it's a different time every day. It don't matter if it's in the morning or at night. It don't matter. It's like schedule it, physically schedule time with Jesus into your calendar. Revolve the rest of your day around him instead of him around the rest of your day. Schedule time for Bible reading and prayer and push yourself a little bit. You know, hey, if you don't do it at all, five minutes is good. If you already do five minutes, don't cut it. <laughs> Should be challenging ourselves a little bit to spend a little more time with him. Add five minutes a week for the next, you know, five weeks and you'll be at at least 25 minutes to a half an hour, right? This work is just essential to what we do. There's no, we live in a microwave generation where it's like, if we can't cook it in the microwave or if the website doesn't load up fast enough or if this streaming device ain't working, I'm on to the next one. We got plenty of streaming options, okay? We can't be in a microwave generation about our relationship with Jesus. We don't build relationships that way with people and you can't build that relationship with him like that. So our second carry out, read Romans 6 to 16. Now, remember we took a break. Two weeks ago, we read Romans 1 through 5. Then we took a break to hit on the story of Abraham because it was so relevant to what we were, what we were reading through in Galatians. Now we're going to go back. We're going to finish the rest of Romans 6 through 16. It's 10 chapters. If you, have, if you didn't read Romans the first time, like, don't trip. It's fine. Just read the first five chapters too. Don't start in 6. It'll be mad confusing. So start in 1. If you, or even if you forgot what you read, maybe go back to 1. Like two or three chapters a day. It's a good read too. Romans is an incredible, incredible letter. All right, so that is it. Those are our two next steps. And uh, I just have a couple of announcements and then we'll pray and we'll get out of here. Uh, one is uh, Tuesday night is our membership class. If you uh, are signed up, you should have received an email about it with a Zoom link. We're going to do it on Zoom. There's a couple reasons for that. One is we just lack of space. We just don't have a ton of space to meet. And so, uh, and people have kids. That's another reason. So it's convenient. We're going to meet on Zoom, 7 p.m. If you did register for that class or I sent you the email or you're here and you're like, actually, I want to do that, see me afterward. I have the packets, the in-person. I want you to get these packets in your hand that we're going to go through during the class. So that's 7 p.m. on Tuesday. If you didn't get an email or you want to join in, let me know and I'll get you the link. The next thing is a volunteers meeting. Anybody, we have a lot of people volunteering on different things. I'm going to have a meeting for volunteers on the 19th. It's a, it's a two Tuesdays from now. It's going to be on Zoom. It's going to be 7 p.m. You can expect an email Monday. It's just like an organizational thing. We're going to do this probably quarterly just to get everybody on the same page, get everything flowing as we bring development and order to the chaos of church planting. So we're going to all get on the same page. If you don't volunteer yet, but you want to be a part of that meeting because you're about to step into it, let me know. I'd love, for, it's not a closed meeting. Does that make sense? It's just specific to people volunteering. So if you don't volunteer, it might just be like, what's this for? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is beautiful and it is glorious. And you equate your word with your name. Thank you for our freedoms in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the freedoms you've afforded us to gather together and worship you in spirit and in truth through song and through the preaching of your word. I pray that we would all leave here with something we can grab on to today. Something that you've done in us that has maybe slightly changed our outlook on something or propelled us forward, God, into your grace. We love you. We pray for this community. Pray for our friends here at Slayton House, our friends at, in Wild Lake and Columbia and the surrounding cities, God. I just pray that they would, your blessing and, your, and, your, and, your, and your, the honor of your name, the glory of your name would just, would be known to them, God. Help us be a part of that. Help us love this community. Man, the way you love us and the way you love Jesus. Father, as we go, bless our gathering. Please, Lord Jesus, keep the rain away. As we gather together at our little, our little fall picnic, it's going to be so much fun. And I just pray that it would be a blast for everyone. We love you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.